Welcome to the Back of the Archive. I'm Anna, and today we're looking into the case of Wendy Jerome. At 7 p.m. on Thanksgiving 1984, Wendy Jerome went to deliver a card to a friend. However, she never made it back home. Hours later, her body was found in a dumpster. She had been raped and beaten to death. The lack of witnesses and clues made the case go cold, but in September of 2020, only a few months ago, an arrest was finally made. This is yet another case solved years later thanks to the advances on DNA and forensics. So let's dive into it. It was 7 p.m. on November 22, 1984. It was Thanksgiving, and 14-year-old Wendy Jerome left her home in Rochester. She had just had dinner with her father, and while they waited for her mother to come home from work to have dessert altogether, she decided to go to a friend's house. Her friend lived nearby, and it was her birthday the following day, so since Wendy wouldn't be able to see her, she decided to deliver her birthday card early. Her parents had asked her to be back before 8. However, when the clock struck way past 8 and she still wasn't home, they knew something wasn't right. Her parents immediately called the police and the search began. Soon after, Wendy's body was found in a school courtyard just a few streets away from her house. She had been raped and beaten to death. There were no witnesses, nobody heard anything, no clues whatsoever. The autopsy concluded Wendy had died from blunt force trauma and multiple lacerations to her body, suggesting she put up a fight against her attacker. Wendy had also been sexually assaulted, and DNA was recovered from the scene. However, in 1984, these samples were worth near to nothing. Forensic science was still in the early stages, and it wouldn't be until years later that DNA could be analysed and matched through several databases. And so, with no leads to the case, it gradually went cold. Police never entirely gave up, but there was little they could do with no clues or leads. Marlene Jerome, Wendy's mother, was in pain for decades. The unsolved murder of her teenage daughter made her require medication and therapy. The questions nobody could ever answer haunted her and the rest of her family. With the advances of DNA over the years, investigators brought up the case several times in an attempt to eventually find a match to the samples recovered from the scene. The first time was back in the year 2000. The sample was ran through the Combined DNA Index System, also known as CODIS, but no results came back. This was still in the early days of forensic science using DNA to potentially solve cold cases, so there was still a lot to be done. In 2016, the advances in DNA technology allowed investigators to analyze more items of potential evidence, thus narrowing down the list of suspects. The database had also been completed in the past decade and a half, and identification was much more precise. However, it wasn't until 2019 when the state would consider there was enough evidence to grant permission to test for familial DNA. Familial DNA is a way for investigators to open new leads when cases are growing cold. Using DNA recovered from a crime scene, they run its profile through a state database and compare the profiles. Even if the profile is not an exact match, the similarity can be strong enough evidence to consider someone a suspect, especially when there are no other leads in the case. This match is not evidence in itself, and cannot be used to make an arrest but it opens up new paths for investigators to follow in order to try and find ties to the victim and the crime. Once the suspect can be put at the crime scene by investigations, witnesses or other evidence, authorities can ask for a sample to conduct a second profiling and confirm whether the sample is indeed from the suspect. Although it is considered controversial since some find it to be a violation of privacy rights, familial DNA has helped solve many cold cases in the recent years. We recently covered the cold case of Tina Fails on this channel, which was solved over 30 years later thanks to a match found through CODIS. So in 2019, results came back with a list of potential suspects. Using other evidence from the case, investigators were able to narrow down that list and focus on the most relevant ones. 
Eventually, in September of 2020, they made an arrest. Timothy Williams, a Florida resident who lived in Rochester, very close to Wendy at the time she was murdered. Soon after Wendy's death, he had moved to Florida. We'll take up Timothy Lee Williams. Williams waived extradition yesterday in a Brevard County Jail court hearing. He was arrested Wednesday after police found him in Melbourne. Williams will be taken to New York within the next 30 days to stand trial for rape and murder. Not much information has been released on Timothy Williams, other than the fact that he lived in the same neighborhood as Wendy. He was 20 years old at the time she was killed, and apparently they didn't know each other. Timothy Williams pleaded not guilty for the three counts of murder in the second degree, and is awaiting his trial, which has been set to June of 2021. The investigation is still ongoing, and we still have to see what comes out of this trial. Thank you so much for watching this quick video, I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up if you did, and subscribe if you enjoy this content so I can see you in the next video.